Did you ever wonder how software engineers you? Why is growth a state of being in our culture? And can we even avoid all the matrix that is being forced on us? The numbers of likes, shares, tweets, retweets, etc. All of these questions are the topics of today's conversation with the artist Ben Grosser. So, shall we start? We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey podcast listeners, as always, thank you. Thank you for coming back. Today's episode is the first part of a conversation I recorded with the artist Ben Grosser. The conversation with Ben was so enriching, eye-opening, and as often happens, it made me think a lot. And I'm positive you would feel the same. Grosser focuses on the cultural, social, and political effects of software. His works have been exhibited at major international venues, exhibitions, and festivals around the world, including... IBM in New York, the Barbican Center in London, Museum Kessel House in Berlin, and many more. The New Yorker, Wire, The Atlantic, The Guardian, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, all of which wrote about him. Beside his artistic practice, Ben is an associate professor of new media in the School of Art and Design, co-founder of the Critical Technology Studies Lab at the National Center for Supercomputing Application, also known as the NCSA, and a faculty affiliate in the School of Information Sciences, all at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Good morning, Ben. Good very night in your place. What's the time now? Because I know that you have your own way of doing things. That's right. Yeah, here it's uh, 1 a.m. So good morning to you and <laughs> good evening. Good late evening to me, I guess. Yeah, so it's already you can understand how I appreciate Ben's effort because all our previous conversation was at 1 a.m. in his time. So <laughs> there is a lot of effort already in the preparation for this. Ben, welcome. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for reaching out. In my own humble opinion, you are a very, very interesting artist in the work that uh, you are doing. And I'm positive that by the end of this podcast, a lot of our listeners are going to be super excited. Before we dive deep into some of the works that you have been doing, can you introduce yourself maybe shortly? Yeah, sure. I'm an artist and a professor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign in the United States. Um, and as an artist... And as a professor, I focus on the cultural, social, and political effects of software, thinking about how the way a piece of software is designed leads us to act and interact in certain kinds of ways. And so that's the subject of my work as an artist. It's also my subject uh, when I do writing and speaking and, and those kinds of activities as well. I'm very much interested how you got to work with technology because your medium is technology. Normally when you talk about art, people immediately think about painting and colors and sculpture and maybe music, but your medium is technology. What led you to work with technology? You know, I, I got my start as an undergraduate, even before an undergraduate, my interest was music. I was a trumpet player in high school and in college, I really got into music composition and computer music became my obsession. And so that's where I really started to get interested in the ways that writing code could have interesting effects aesthetically. Um, in that case, writing code to generate sound and also writing code to help with the composition process. And I had some great teachers along those lines too as an undergraduate. So that was probably the place that I really started to put all that together. As I kind of have kept going in various ways, I've interacted with technology in a lot of different contexts and fields, but I've always been looking, I guess, at technology, both from that kind of interested, obsessed, this is fun, this is interesting, I want to play with this kind of a position, but also what can I do differently with this that couldn't be done before? And then in the last 10 or 15 years, I would say it's as much of those as well as what is this technology doing? How is it changing who we are? Who is it most in service of? 
And uh, where can I get in the middle of that in some way? You say, what can I do different with it? Why you want to do something different with it? Why it's always kind of the motivation that artists have is that they see something and immediately they think what we can or what we could do with that, not what it can do. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I remember when I first got interested in computer music, in my case, it was writing code to generate sound is where I really started. It was at this moment where um, you had your synthesizers, your MIDI synthesizers that were really popular at the time often used to recreate sounds that we had heard in some way. And, and even a lot of people in, in kind of computer music world were focused on, well, how could I write code to generate sound that uh, mimics a trumpet or sounds like a flute or really is indistinguishable from a clarinet? And I just never understood why anybody would want any of that. Um, I really <laughs> wanted to make a sound that sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before. That's what seemed attractive to me about the technology is that I could have an experience that was otherwise impossible or otherwise unattainable. And I mean, why is that my drive? I don't know. I guess I'm just constantly in search of aesthetic experience that catches my attention, maybe. And technology often seems like uh, an opportunity along those lines. Ben, in many conversations and talks that you gave in the past, there were many things that uh, captured my attention, but there are two sentences or statements that I want to hear your opinion about. So one of the things that you said is that software engineers us. What do you mean in this sentence? So yeah, I think to fully flesh out what I probably would have said is that we engineer software and software in turn engineers us back. And as humans, we tend to think of ourselves as the builder of tools. We assemble our, especially when it comes to the digital, we assemble our digital world. We write software, we make hardware, we design hardware, and we're surrounded by it all the time now. But as humans, we can't help, even if we want to, we can't help but embed the ways we think into that software, into those tools. So, you know, whether it's a a search engine or a social media platform. And one example would be that if you look at a, the largest social media platform on the planet, which would be Facebook, which has 3 billion plus users and counting, one of its primary features and a feature that has been there from the beginning are the visible quantifications throughout the interface that count likes and shares and comments and how many minutes ago or seconds ago something happened or how many people you're supposed to be wishing happy birthday today, for example. And after 15 years of Facebook, perhaps this doesn't seem unnatural, but the idea that we were counting with precision exactly how many people laughed at our joke, or exactly how many friends we have, or exactly how many seconds ago something happened, as if that was important, that's a certain kind of way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that I think comes from, for example, Mark Zuckerberg and the people he assembled to build that tool. It got embedded into Facebook. And now we all think about ourselves in these ways. It's so difficult for us to not think about and assess ourselves from a metric viewpoint. So that's just one example of, of how the way that a certain kind of segment, uh, maybe a, a segment of the population that's really focused on data analytics and quantitative analysis and, and metrics, thinks about, well, what should we make as a social media platform? And then they build it, and now we all think that way. So when I say software engineers us, that's part. That's, that's one example of, of, I think, how it's it's changing who we are and what we do. As I mentioned, um, I read the one sentence, I don't remember who said it, that first we shape our buildings, then our buildings shape us. It will be a very interesting conversation to discuss the difference between software and buildings. You actually a rebel against this type of a way of Facebook quantifying our life and you develop a tool that you call the Facebook Demetricator. What is the Facebook Demetricator? Yes, the Facebook Demetricator is a browser, web browser extension that uh, it's free and open source and anyone can download it and um, install it on Chrome or Firefox. And what it does is it hides all visible metrics across the Facebook interface. So instead of saying eight people liked this, it just says people like this. Instead of saying, you know, you 
someone else and eight other people loved this post. It just says you and other people love this post. It just hides all the numbers wherever they appear in the interface. And it really comes out of, it's a project that I've been working on for almost 10 years now. Um, I started working on it in 2011. I released it in 2012. And it really grew out of my own experience of the platform, just as an excited user of Facebook back when that was the hot um, social media platform that everybody wanted to be on. Um, <laughs> it's not anymore, of course, yeah. well, I'm kind of giggling like, well, you're giggling here too. But, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there was a time, right, yeah. when, when Facebook was held that position. And I mean, really it grew out of, for me, that I, I found myself paying an inordinate amount of attention to those numbers, becoming self-aware of the fact that as I scanned my feed or looked at what my activity was, that I was focusing more on how many people liked my post rather than on who liked it. And then I would see how much it was commented on rather than on what they had said. It's almost as if I was just, you know, the how many and how much was more important than the who and the what. And I started to ask myself, why? Why do I care about this so much? I mean, what is happening here? And, and that just led me to, to kind of go down the road of thinking about, well, look at all the numbers. And I mean, when you really start to look, they're all over the place. And I wanted to, as an artist, you know, the way I think about these things is I want to make something in order to ask and investigate questions that I have. And so that led me to create the Demetricator, which was the first extension I made to do this kind of work, really at first so I could try it, but also so I could put it out in the world and let anyone out there try out Facebook for themselves without the numbers and to see how it changed their experience of the site. And now you also develop it for Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, I have one for Twitter and Instagram as well. Those came a few years later. I focused exclusively on Facebook for a number of years, but now I maintain them for other platforms i think what kind of i don't know if surprised me or maybe this is because knowing artists and working with artists i'm already familiar with i always say that artists are at the forefront of what we know and what we don't know and they are always at least five ten years before the culture or the market because you developed it in 2012 and in 2020 or the end of 2019 actually facebook instagram and twitter started to experiment with a similar idea. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, all three, I think maybe the first rumbling started in 2018 with uh, Twitter's CEO talking about it, not changing anything, but just talking about maybe the follower metric is not incentivizing behavior that we hope to be seeing on the platform. Uh, but yeah, by 2019, Instagram was talking about it and Facebook was also talking about experimenting with it. And I'm interested, did they contact you? Did they get to... Um, I'm sorry, I, I giggle. You know, <laughs> the first contact I had from Facebook was in 2016 when they came after me with a bogus legal challenge to get Facebook to Metricator kicked off yes? the Chrome web store. And um, I was fortunate to have representation from the Electronic Frontier Foundation in that dispute and uh, was able to get it reinstated. This is shortly before the 2016 election the, in the wow. United States, the election that uh, brought Trump to power. So that was the first I heard of it. No, they, they never contacted me other than through legal channels. Um, when Instagram started talking about it in 2019 and getting a tremendous amount of positive press for their idea, um, <laughs> They, you know, they never contacted me, but a few months after that started happening, they did come after me and get Instagram to Metricator kicked off the Chrome web store. So it's actually still off. I have it out there for Firefox still, but uh, I haven't been able to get it back onto Chrome. So no, they haven't seemed interested in talking to me about it. And in fact, they haven't, at least in the United States, I don't know what it's like in Spain, but in the United States, all the metrics are still there on Instagram. All the metrics are still there on Fire on Facebook, and all the metrics are still there on Twitter. All these experiments didn't change anything in the United States. Well, I guess in my question, I was a bit optimistic because I always encourage collaboration with artists because of the work artists are doing. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if they called, I'll, I'll want to, you know, part of the challenge for them with this is that they have assembled 
an ecosystem, uh, you know, a social network ecosystem that is highly dependent on the production of engagement by users and visible metrics are an essential component of that production. So when Instagram came out and said they were interested in possibly hiding, you know, they're going to experiment with, they're interested in user well-being. It's kind of how they talked about it at the time. And so they're going to experiment with hiding metrics. They're going to test it out, I think is what they said. Well, I suspect they're, what their tests showed is that it had some moderate negative consequence on profit. <laughs> so perhaps they um, changed their mind. I mean, I don't know. I don't have an inside view there. But... <laughs> well, at least one thing I hope we get through this uh, question is that the recognition that you were the one that kind of started with this and not what the media amplify about the company. So I have another statement to ask you, and this time it's about growth. And before I ask you about the growth, let's take a short break. Hi, listeners. It's clear that our speakers are at the intersection of art and innovation, but they didn't just arrive there casually. They developed their skills, gained knowledge, and more importantly, grew their artistic mindset would you like to develop some of these skills, capabilities, or a growth mindset? Then I would encourage you to check out our art-based learning experiences. Whether you want to build your leadership skills or your innovation competencies, our training can be just what you are looking for. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. Ben, I want to ask you about another statement you said in the past you said growth is a state of being what does it mean yeah i think that statement for me comes out of trying to think about what visible metrics are doing have been doing you know why they're so attractive to us in these social media interfaces so my attempts to think about that from a more theoretical perspective and for me this gets at the what i tend to think of as the desire for more it's really that you know, as a species, we evolved with a need for esteem, with a need to feel valued, whether by others, but also confidence in ourselves. Um, and that worked really well for the human species for almost all of time until very recently, I would say. Um, it's had some issues. And what it did is it ran into capitalism, where now value is quantifiable and growth is a constant requirement for success. And so we end up in this situation where, especially when we think about social media platforms that are constantly quantifying our sociality back to us, telling us how many friends we have, how many followers we have, how much our post was liked or shared or commented or retweeted, et cetera. We, it's very difficult for us to not want those numbers to always be larger. It's great to have 100 followers, but I'd rather have 200. It's great to have 100 likes, but I'd rather have 101. People with millions of followers buy more. We want these numbers, especially when they reflect on us, to keep going up. And that's the world we live in. It's a world that is constantly counting and constantly valuing more. But more isn't really an achievable thing. It's not an end goal when you, if more is what you want, well, then how do you know when you have it, right? It's like, you can never really get there. It's like this horizon line that you can never really reach. You know, this is present in so many different ways in society. I talk a lot about software and platforms and metrics and all of that, but of course we see it in money and, uh, you know, wealth and, and the accumulation of wealth and the way in which that produces extreme inequality. We see it in the environment and the way in which the absolute pursuit of more at any cost has dire consequences for the planet. Um, so for me, this thing of growth, we have assembled a societal system for ourselves that requires endless growth to survive. And so in some ways, we are just a part of it. Yeah, we are feeding the system. Yes, it's hard to get it's hard to get away from it. So I think that's probably what I was talking about. You also created kind of again, I don't know if representation, criticism, artwork, how to call it, that you named order of magnitude. And maybe we can listen for a few seconds from the work. 
many more 400, 500, 100,000 for 100 or 200. To grow it, therefore it would grow thousands. I mean, there doesn't necessarily have to be more. Almost a million. More focused on growing really quickly. More than 40%. More than a third of a few thousand more schools. And it's growing really quickly. More than one of, but this is way more efficient. Hundreds of thousands of more, that there's more value, that there's more value. We'll share more. There are actually 65 more than 80. It's just about 85. A more open. More open, more, more, open, more open, and more, more, more. 24 million to 100 million. Um, maybe something more for share more with more sharing more. Thousands, 50 million growing more, more than 100 million. 100 million, just growing, growing. Tens of thousands of 50 million, half of about a 95% and faster than 200 more than more, more than more, faster and a lot more. I think it's almost a thousand millions. I think almost 10,000. Can you tell us what is order of magnitude? I remember when I was preparing for our conversation and I watched it. Oh my God, I felt that I need an oxygen support. <laughs> I felt so anxious. Yes. Yes. So order of magnitude, it's a film, you know, as an artist who mostly for the last decade has made code-based artworks and often that manipulate existing software platforms. I wanted to take a step back and think about who engineers software. You know, we talked about this earlier, right? It's like we engineer software and software engineers us back. And so I think I've spent a lot of time on the software engineers us back part. But with this piece, I really wanted to think about the who engineers software part. And so I chose Mark Zuckerberg as the quintessential Silicon Valley CEO, you know, one of the richest people to ever make and write and imagine software. And I decided to take every video appearance, every publicly available video appearance of his from his first appearance at age 19 in 2004 up through his last appearance in 2018. I made this piece in 2019. So I went up through um, his last appearance in 2018. So 15 years. So wow. from age 19 to age 34 for Mark Zuckerberg. And I treated it as an archive and I decided to mine it for the occurrence or the, the moments he spoke one of three things. Whenever he spoke the word more, whenever he spoke the word grow or growth or grew and every his every utterance of a metric like 100,000 or, or 2 million. And I just made a supercut out of all of those extractions. Now, when I had this idea originally, I thought, okay, I'll go and I'll get all the mores and the grows and the numbers out of this archive. And it's probably going to add up to what would be a long supercut relatively in terms of the internet and, and supercut <laughs> videos of maybe five minutes. And I wasn't sure anybody would want to watch five minutes of Mark Zuckerberg saying the word more, but that's okay. I don't always try to worry about if someone's going to be interested. I wanted to see what it would be like. And I got to five minutes and it was clear there was plenty more to work through. And then I got to 10 minutes and it was still going. And I got to 15 minutes and I knew it wasn't done. And I kept going. And by the time I finished the project, it was 47 minutes long of just the word more grow 1 billion, essentially. And I think the scale of the work is part of the subject of the work. You know, that Mark Zuckerberg says these words that those many times, yeah, you know, that that is such a, a focus of how he speaks and how he talks about the company and how he articulates the mission and thinks about the world is through these three categories of speech. Makes it a mantra. Yeah, it became the subject. And so the thing we were talking about before in terms of how to watch this film, you know, I get a lot of different reactions to it. But one of the primary reaction I get is people feeling like they can't really watch it for very long, that it's a difficult film to watch. And my recommendation there is a couple. One is watch it with a buddy. Like, don't be alone in your bedroom with Mark in a tiny corner in, of the window, you know, just like barking the word more at you for five or 10 minutes until you can't take it anymore. Get a friend, put it on a big screen, and treat it like a film as opposed to like a, an internet video. <laughs> the, the truth is there's, there's a lot of humor, I think, that's still in film. And, and there's a lot of kind of arcs too. You see, because it's all in chronological time, so it starts at, in 2004 and ends at, at the end of 2018. You see Mark grow from age 19 to age 34. You see 
video technology change from age 19 to, you know, from 2004 or 2018, you see the internet change in certain ways. Like there's a lot of history of the last 15 years um, that's kind of captured in, in that arc. And I think, you know, more broadly for me, the, the film is, is a way of chronicling Silicon Valley's obsession with growth over the last 15 years. It's through the lens of one company and one person, but that person has been in, very influential in, in that culture for you know, what it means to build a company and, and how one evaluates success or failure. Yeah, I'm super impressed because uh, I don't know if you are the only one in the world with so many Mark Zuckerberg hours. I don't know if you are the holder of the largest videos archive of uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I remember that in previous conversations, you mentioned that some of the videos were not available in the West. So you find someone in China and like the old ones. And like, so there is a lot, a lot of work that went into these 47 minutes, which kind of you started to touch it in your answer. And I want to ask your opinion about the Silicon Valley culture, because it's something that you refer to in your work, it maybe occupy you while you are doing your work. What is your opinion on this Silicon Valley culture? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think about it and have been following it a lot. I mean, I, you know, I, I one of my daily loads on my web browser is Hacker News, the Y Combinator, venture capitalist kind of Silicon Valley Reddit, you might call it, where developers post things of interest to the community and, and have long involved discussions often. So, you know, it's not just that I'm interested in the the things that they make, but I'm interested in how they talk about them, how they think about them, what they what they want to do. And it's a, a as someone who's critical every day of software and how it's built and what it does and what it's produced in the world, it's also amazing. I'm very critical of Facebook. I've also gained tremendous value from Facebook personally. I've made all kinds of connections I never would have made otherwise. i um, learned of things I wouldn't uh, have come across. So iPhones in our pocket, you know, Zoom in the middle of the pandemic, like take your pick, you know, the last 15, 20 years or, or longer, you know, back into the 90s through the emergence of the World Wide Web, um, mid-ish 90s, a little bit earlier, I guess. Um, these are amazing moments. So Silicon Valley built that. And not only Silicon Valley, of course, but it gets a lot of credit and certainly significant amounts have come out of that area of the world. But it also is an extremely homogenous culture where, first of all, it's not a diverse place in terms of gender and race, but also in terms of even just education. I mean, I'm in the United States, I'm at the University of Illinois, it's a top computer science school, and it's one of the feeders to Silicon Valley in terms of our computer science program. There's five or six programs in the country that are producing a significant proportion of the people who are writing software in California. Nothing against those particular ways of thinking. And I think we have some amazing people in our computer science department. But when you have such homogeneity, you tend to have fewer diverse ways of thinking happening. And so I think this is a quality that is very prevalent throughout that I think about a lot anyway, that it's not that all developers are the same. They're not. It's not that they all think the same way. They don't. But a lot of them come from the same programs. A lot of them work in the same few companies. A lot of them live in the same few zip codes. And a lot of them are thinking about building software not to solve an existing problem or to change the world in the most positive way possible, but how can they grow as fast as possible in order to be acquired? this becomes the motivation for so many of them. It's a, uh, you know, for the last 15 years or so, it's been the gold rush of the 21st century. And it's produced a lot of wealth. It's produced amazing, you know, experiences through technology, and it's produced tremendous damage and destruction for the world as well. I mean, I, I live in the United States. We now have a new president here. We're talking in uh, early 2021. But just even the ways in which the Facebook platform is one example, you know, has played out in terms of the way in which, you know, everything from fake news and, you know, we can, we can go down that whole path of, of interest. But 
these are all mixed up, I think, partially because the culture is not organized around how can we make the best things for society. It's about how can we be first and biggest. So it leads me to my next uh, question, because we started to speak about it in the past. One of the things that I think surprised me in the movie Social Dilemma, that it was the first time that I heard that Stanford has the Persuasion Technology Lab, that in many ways, it's kind of, I have to admit, kind of scared me that to think that there is a lab that actually think about how to create this addictive behavior, at least as an outsider, I don't know exactly what they do in the lab. Just from the name, I can think about this addictiveness and stickiness that those technology creates. Now, I don't know how it relates or if it relates to the work that you are doing at the Critical Technology Study Labs at the National Center for Supercomputing Application. And you are also kind of faculty member, not kind of, you are faculty member at the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory at the School of Information Sciences. Can you tell us more about those, this work, type of work that you're doing? Sure, yeah. You know, my home department in the university is the School of Art and Design. I teach in the New Media program where I'm teaching New Media undergraduates and uh, also uh, graduate students in our MFA studio art program. But I hold these appointments and I'm part of other units on campus in order to have multidisciplinary conversations. That's why I'm interested in doing it. So the School of Information Sciences is, is a great example of, you know, it's funny, the, the architecture of the University of Illinois campus, it's a huge, one of these huge, you know, spans hundreds and hundreds of acres of land and some of it agricultural with you know, crops and cows and, and that kind of thing, all the way up to the engineering side of the campus, which is a, a very prominent engineering school, very big. And the, the architecture of the campus is such that kind of the arts and the humanities are at one end and science and engineering is at the other. And the School of Information Sciences is almost architecturally right in the middle. And it's the right place for that school because it's this place where it's not just thinking about the digital and the computational but it's thinking about the human and where is the human in that equation and, and how is this a human activity, a cultural activity, and not only as a computational activity. And of course, there are people on the further on the, you know, on one side who think those ways too, and on other sides, I don't mean to segment everybody, but it's just funny how the architecture leads to this kind of a layout and the school of information sciences, the I school, you know, it's where data science happens, but it's also where library science and, and you know, librarianship happens. So I find it a, a fruitful place to be a part of, to engage in conversations and everything from metadata and archives and scrapbooking and storytelling to data science and visualization and computational types of, of topics. The unit for criticism is, is in a different unit, and that's really more of a critical theory kind of uh, place, but it's... Um, uh, meaning it's where the humanists and the artists tend to get together to talk about topics of critical theory. And then NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, where I have a lab with my colleague Jody Bird, who's an indigenous studies scholar, post-colonial theory, and also game studies scholar. You know, NCSA is... I don't know if it's a unit that would have ever come across your landscape from your vantage point, but it has a long storied history. It, it, it's where Mark Andreessen was when he created Netscape, for example, and it's probably one of its most well-known kind of history points is that the web browser was born there, it was Mosaic, you know, originally produced at NCSA. Now, I wasn't a part of it back then, but it's an interesting place. It's a research center on the campus that has all kinds of computational science happening. A lot of it involved in high performance computing. So the kinds of things that require high performance computing, physics and astronomy and those kinds of things. But there's also a strong visualization and kind of aesthetic component that happens there. And so it's a really fun place for me to be a part of in the sense that I have this lab, it's a research lab and you know, we're a part of the culture and society segment of NCSA, and it's broken down into kind of different areas. And so, you know, it intentionally has as part of it a way of thinking about the cultural effects of technology. So that's really 
what my area is about there. And, and for me, it serves as a, as a research. So I don't have a typical artist studio on the campus. Instead, I have a lab with a colleague and it, in a research center on the, on the engineering side of the campus. But it allows me to have, be in all these different kinds of conversations. So you mentioned uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, thinking, and you already did it in the past in the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. And over there, you actually did a very interesting project, if I recall correct, kind of bridging between science and society, science imagery and visual products with society. First of all, I would be happy to hear your take about these projects and then maybe ask you how we can cultivate it more in an era that requires all of us to specialize, 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 specialize. Yeah, it's such a great question. I think the project you're talking about is bug scope. So yeah, I was working at the Beckman Institute for, I worked there for 12 years and it was a really interesting time. Then I worked in the, in the imaging technology group, which provided facilities for visualization and microscopy and imaging, but we also did research projects. And when I, I was still pretty new there and I was part of the group, I was one of the coders on this project called Bugscope, which is we'd just gotten as part of the group, a, a brand new um, electron, scanning electron microscope, a $500,000 instrument back then, turn of the century. And part of that effort was to develop in-house custom software that would uh, make it possible for people over the web, uh, this is a, in the year 1999, um, to log on and control the microscope in real time and to grab images from it. And the idea was to that kids in classrooms all around the country and eventually all around the world could find bugs, insects in their own environment, and then they could put them in the mail and send them to us and we would put the bug in the microscope. And then they could log on through the interface that we developed and control the microscope and have access to this piece of technology they never would get to play with otherwise. You know, an, another big piece of the project was that they also got to chat with our microscopists and we would bring in entomologists. And, and so it was a conversation that was happening in real time as they got to play with the microscope. But you know, bugs under a scanning electron microscope are just amazing looking things. And so visually, it's a way to draw kids into the world of things you can't yet see, but you could get to be a part of, you know, it's a way of creating mystery and wonder and, and activating pathways towards how they could get to have more agency in investigating questions of interest. Sparking curiosity that I think exactly. that, you know, it's like in many ways, lead me to my second part of the question it's like again what i see often i don't want to say that artists are curious more than the rest of the population it's just that i think that in the way they work or the type of work they are doing invites intersections of disciplines so by nature you kind of cross disciplines which i'm asking myself how for example in computer science departments or physics departments, we can have more classes for that matter on psychology or philosophy or history of art or poetry or whatever to kind of open the mind, at least from my perspective to the humanities better. How we can develop this, in your opinion, as someone that also teaching, how we can develop this multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and I always try to bring it to the, I would say to the highest form of a transdisciplinary that we have disciplines, totally different disciplines that come together to create new knowledge. I think about this a lot. I've been thinking about it for a long time. You know, when I first got to Beckman, multidisciplinary science was not the buzzword that it was, that it is now. Now it's almost just kind of, you'll hear that all the time and people, all kinds of people are engaging in various levels of multidisciplinarity, but there's this constant tension between the need, the absolute need for specialization to advance. I can't just read a book on nanotechnology and then go figure out new structures and to build atomic machines, like whatever, like I can't do that. I need a whole, to make a small advance in some, in any field can require, or in many fields can require a lifetime of study in order to push that boundary just a tiny bit further. 
But there's also a need increasingly as we specialize, as the amount of labor it takes to specialize, as, as everybody gets deeper in their own little narrow view of the world. There's also, I think, an important need for people who are good at translating across disciplinary boundaries, who don't feel because of what their interests are, perhaps, that they have to spend all of their time focused in that one direction. And I think why art has been an attractive field for me to land in is that artists aren't beholden to method. You know, if you, in so many fields, in order to make an advance or even to publish in that field, you have to show facility with the, the primary methods within the field. You have to be able to speak the language exactly as it's been done before. And I don't mean you can't evolve the method. You just come along and say, I don't really care what your method is, <laughs> and I'm just going to do it different. That's a hard position to come from. But artists are kind of, that's kind of, that is kind of the method. Yeah. Is the, the method is that you shouldn't, be your method shouldn't be someone else's method. And so that I think, at least for me, makes it feel like an experimental vantage point to look at the world from and makes me feel more comfortable and, and free to go talk to people over here and to talk to people over there and to think about things in different ways and to try to integrate weird, disparate kind of ways of thinking into one project. And I think to kind of go further with this question of like, how do you make productive multidisciplinarity happen towards say transdisciplinary kind of activities? The truth is it's hard work, right? It's hard to talk across these boundaries. It's hard to be the person in the room who doesn't know the method. It's hard to be in conversation with 10 people in the room who know your method. And then there's this one person in the room who doesn't, right? Who wants to also be part of the conversation. So it really comes, I think, from a need to find shared values is how I end up thinking about it. You know, what is it we are hoping? What is it we care about? What is it we want to do? What do we hope? How do we hope to move things forward in, in some way? And that can often be a way of creating a an environment where people can listen to one another. It's a highly labor intensive activity to do it well, because inevitably means you're translating across boundaries and translation can be slow, um, at least for me. But I think I find it personally to be an enjoyable kind of place to live and, and to try to make things happen in, in a place like university. Totally. You said so many things that I can refer to, at least from my world, one of the things that I've noticed, the main difference that I say for me between, again, speaking from my context about art and business, is that for business to advance, they need to look to the past, see what worked and improve it. But artists cannot look to the past and just improve what they did because in many ways you just continue to do the same art that you did in the last five years. So artists always need to look to the future and ask themselves what I can do next what I can do different. How can I stop painting in many ways with my right hand and start painting with my left hand? It's always kind of the experimentation forward. It's never about the improvement of the backward. I don't know if I make sense over I, here. I, it, it certainly makes sense. I, you know, it, it reminds me of where we started this conversation where you asked me, you know, well, what is it? Why were you playing with computers and music? And what was it you were hoping to do? And I talked about wanting to make sounds that didn't sound like anything else before. So what did I make? I made really loud, ugly music that most people didn't like. And, <laughs> and, you know, I would like feel proud of the, I would put on concerts of this music and it would be so loud and harsh and crazy that people would be leaving the hall in the middle of the piece. And I would take it as a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> These days I'm a little bit more interested in audience. And um, you know, that was me at 20, right? When I was like, you know, like if there's nobody left at the end of the piece, then that's a success. And now I, I seek to kind of have more conversation than with nobody. But <laughs> but the attitude, I think like I that attitude that I, I can look back and reflect on in myself at age 20, I see in, you know, the future artists I teach as, as a professor and I do see in the arts in general. And it, the truth is it also happens in other fields too. But I think art is kind of strange in that there is, there's a real kind of valuing of 
it was a cultural value placed on the totally out of left field way of looking at things that doesn't seem like it came from the last thing. Now, when you go back and analyze often, in some ways, you can see how it like one thing led to another. But there's also a bit of a myth, you know, a, a mysticism there, too, right? If like, like it, it came from nowhere. Well, it came from somewhere, but it is a different way of trying to look at the world. I hope that by now you realize why we needed to split the conversation into two. Ben is the type of thinkers that, well, makes you think and reflect. I find myself reflecting on his statements, on his ideas, on his projects quite often. Next week, we will speak about TikTok and creativity, Spotify and Netflix algorithmic profiling, and what is doom scrolling. So until the next time, stay well, stay healthy. I will be waiting for you on another episode of the Artian Podcast. Thanks for listening. As you might know, we are producing our podcast without any help. So if you find this podcast valuable for you, I will be super grateful if you can help us by leaving a rating or a review. It will take you less than a minute and it really, really helps. Special thanks to Daniel Duran who mixed and mastered this episode and Abigail Dyson, our intern who helped us put the message out there. If you are interested in working with us and upskilling your team's capabilities, if you are looking to develop a more creative environment in your business organization, I would recommend you to check our workshops and training, all available on our website. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. All of our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendation, videos, and other materials. Yes, we are social, so you can find us on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or just write us directly at email podcast at theartian.com. Once again, thanks for listening.